There it is. Is exactly like where you are right now. Only much, much better. So this guy in the train, and he seemed to have gotten stuck in one of those abstract chances. And he was going. And Fred said, I think he's in some kind of pain. I think it's a pain crack. And I said, pain crack. Then my lunch is a virus. It's a virus. It's a virus. Allow me to introduce. Oh, may I? The Pickwick Papers, Charles Dickens. Oh, Charles Dickens. Once I read a book he wrote. David Copperfield? We have a David Copperfield amongst us. He's with another group in the South. I Am the Prince by Machiavelli. Oh. As you see, you can't judge a book by its cover. <laughs> I am Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. I am Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. Uh, both of you the same book? My brother is volume one. My brother is volume two. It's a, a great, great pleasure, pleasure to meet you. So the thing about the creative process is everything is built on something else. You know, Shakespeare's stories were built on traditional legends and folk tales, right? Modern stuff is built on Shakespeare. Everything builds on something else. There's no completely new creative thing, if only because if you wrote something completely new, nobody would understand it. I mean, we all have to use words that were developed by someone else. We use ideas that were developed by someone else. Everything is this process of pulling things together and recombining them. And so what's worrying about the sort of copyright police is that they want to prevent recombination. They want to have the law come in and say recombination isn't legal, right? That only, you know, you have to get a license for every single thing you use. Well, if you do that, you stifle creativity. It's almost impossible to get a license for every single thing you use. I mean, imagine if every word you used, you had to call up the person who came up with that word, or if they're dead, their descendants, and say, can I have permission to use this word? I mean, you never get through a sentence. And so similarly, we see creativity stifled, you know, songs, pull samples from all sorts of different songs. Imagine if you had to call up each person that you borrowed a, a note from, or a tune from, or a sample from, and get permission. All sorts of music would become impossible. It would become illegal. And I think that's what we're seeing in the wider culture is that this notion that we become a permission-asking society, that every time you do something, you have to ask permission. I mean, that's, you know, the, that's basically against the freedom culture we have here. That's the opposite of a free country. What is it? Let me see. Tales of Mystery and Imagination by Edgar Allan Poe. Learn it quickly so that we can burn it. You burn it? Yes, of course, we have to, so that no one can take them away from us. Yes, we burn the books, but we keep them up here, where nobody can find them. I'm going to relate a tale full of horror. The Saint Simon, head of the second family, Charlotte de Lorraine, Unique de Sully, the Diane de Boudou, première femme de mon père. How much there is to tell. At that moment, Mr. The question of the archive is not a question of the past. It is not the question of a concept dealing with the past that might already be at our disposal. 
an archivable concept of the archive. It is a question of the future. The question of the future itself. The question of a response, of a promise, and of a responsibility for tomorrow. The archive. If we want to know what that will have meant, we will only know in times to come. Not tomorrow, but in times to come. Later on, or perhaps never. Welcome to another virus uh, mythologies. Uh, I hope you prepared some popcorn or you will make some popcorn because uh, tonight uh, we have a special guest and we will also show many more videos like the one before. Uh, so what did we just see? Uh, Dishan, Fahrenheit, uh, Aaron Schwartz and Derrida. And this brings us already uh, to our today's topic. Uh, which is uh, which goes a step beyond, a step further, I would say, and maybe even a step back or into the future. We will see uh, from the previous episodes. Um, this will also be a very self-referential uh, episode, uh, an episode in which uh, we will try to explain uh, what this is all about. Of course, this is impossible to explain. Uh, so let's start from the start. And the start, the beginning is here you can see it uh, it's a small plate which says dmtv uh, it is something which was created uh, in a moment of utter helplessness uh, on the 23rd of march so a bit more than one month one month and a half ago uh, it was originally called the world after coronavirus uh, so at the beginning we had uh, TV shows, we still have them, we call it TV, because we like retrofuturism. Uh, we had these episodes with, from Noam Chomsky to Saskia Sassen, Ejet Temel Puran, uh, Yanis Varoufakis, many others. And in the meantime, and it makes me really happy, it was watched by around 2 million people. So in one month and a half, uh, something which was created out of this room uh, from self-isolation. And uh, this month and a half passed very quickly. Uh, we started from a virus uh, and we ended up with language. Uh, we started with coronavirus, but we ended up in semiotics. Uh, so at the very beginning of the virus mythologies, many people were asking me, uh, but how can you speak about science, semiotics, language uh, at this moment when so many people are either infected or actually unfortunately dying? Uh, and my answer is the following one. Uh, the virus itself is already a semiotic machine. Uh, the virus itself generates meaning. Catastrophe, disaster, apocalypse generates meaning. Not only in the meaning in the sense which meaning John uh, uh, from Patmos, for instance, received through his visions, uh, which is the revelation by, by Jesus Christ, uh, not only this meaning, but then how will we interpret the meaning or how will we interpret uh, the global pandemic that happened in 2020? Uh, is it something normal? Is there a return to the normal? Or are we actually witnessing a normalization of the very same ideology, which in the first place through climate crisis, destroying habitat, eating animals, uh, led to this situation in which we are today? Uh, so my whole point, and that's uh, one of the main points of virus mythologies, is that we as homo sapiens, as uh, the human species, cannot escape meaning. Uh, we cannot escape semiosis. We cannot escape uh, producing meaning. Uh, and since we cannot escape producing meaning, uh, we also cannot escape the archive. The archive, the archive in the sense, not of putting something, for instance, this, this is already an archive. This is already in an archive. This is already on the internet, on YouTube. Download as soon as possible, as our next guest will say. But this is the archive. Why is it an archive? Because what I'm saying to you now uh, uh, is already the past. Uh, what, but it's not only the past. And that, that's Jacques Derrida's point from his book, Archive Fever from 1995. Uh, that the archive has to be understood as he returns back to a Greek word, uh, archeion, uh, which 
could mean, at least in Derrida's, Derrida's interpretation, an arc, uh, an archive as an arc, which is not just something where you uh, uh, save some artifacts and put uh, objects, feelings, signs, videos like this, talk, movings of hands, and so on, into a box, uh, uh, and then you preserve it. Uh, uh, an archive is, in Derrida's uh, uh, interpretation and theory, something which is uh, necessarily uh, uh, pointed towards the future as well. It is a sort of an arc, remember Noah's arc, for instance, uh, through which something is transmitted into the future. Uh, so, for instance, uh, this will be watched later in the future to some certain point. Maybe it will be put, put offline uh, from YouTube, maybe not. Let's see. Uh, but this already is a message to the future. And we started uh, from the very start with coronavirus. Uh, then we moved to uh, Baudrillard, Franco Berardi, Bifo, McLuhan, uh, uh, many other uh, theorists uh, uh, who are connected in one way or the other way to language and to semiotics. Uh, in order to show that uh, power is always connected uh, to, to, to language. And the archive is also always connected to power. Uh, Derrida at one point uh, says that uh, the theory of the archive is a theory of institute, institution. Yeah, my God, my Balkan English, in, something which uh, makes an institution. You know, the archive is always connected to, to, to an institution. It institutionalizes something. Uh, so the archive in Derrida's theory is always about the law. It's always about someone who authorizes something to end up in an archive. I mean, in this sense, it also could be connected to Roland Barthes' theory about history as a discourse, and in which sense every history uh, is a discourse, and every ideology is also a discourse. It is a narrative which, through hegemony, is imposed, and then it produces meaning. Uh, it is also connected uh, to Freud, to a death drive, uh, but is also what is most important to me, uh, uh, it connected to the future. Uh, it's connected to the future in the sense, for instance, uh, tonight we don't, today or yesterday, uh, we don't have the time to go into nuclear semiotics. Uh, but for instance, uh, if you just research a bit uh, nuclear semiotics, uh, the human interference uh, task force, uh, you will come uh, to to a very important topic today, uh, uh, precisely about this kind of messages in the bottle or a message in this screen uh, 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 from which I cannot get out currently, uh, uh, but I'm getting through the semiosphere out of this screen to your screen. Uh, uh, and the question is then uh, in nuclear semiotics, you know, how do you transmit this kind of message uh, 10,000 years into the future? If you have, for instance, radioactivity, nuclear waste, which will stay radioactive for thousands of years, how do you transmit a message into the future? If you have in mind that uh, uh, the most ancient written uh, uh, history is old, like what, 5,000 years or something, and we have to create a language for the next thousand years. So here it is where the archive becomes a crucial term archive in the sense of an arc. Uh, what did we learn out of the global pandemics? What did we learn out of coronavirus? Uh, how can we transmit the knowledge we have today to those who will come tomorrow? And how will those tomorrow understand the message which we are sending today? If we imagine that those tomorrow uh, are there tomorrow watching this in 5,000 years. I mean, as soon as I say it, it sounds ridiculous, of course, uh, because uh, in the current situation, where the doomsday clock is set 100 seconds to midnight, uh, we cannot even imagine the next 100 years. Uh, or if we imagine the next 100 years, it looks rather bad. So at this moment, uh, it's very difficult to, to even imagine that this kind of uh, uh, video or whatever this is will be transmitted in such a distant future. Um, so that's one question, uh, why the archive is a crucial term and why we have Kenneth Goldsmith tonight with us. But before we come to, to Kenneth uh, and uh, before I announce him, which will be very soon, I think there is also one other perspective which is important uh, when we speak about the archive. Uh, so if for Jacques Derrida, uh, time is the crucial component, like time in the sense that the archive is not necessarily something connected just to the past, 
but it is always connected and oriented toward the future to come. Um, there is also another perspective, which of course can be connected, uh, and that's the perspective of uh, Michel Foucault, uh, who in uh, his book, uh, Order of Things, uh, the Archaeology of Human Sciences, at the very start, uh, you probably know about this, uh, uh, mentions this, uh, famous uh, passage from Borges and his uh, certain Chinese uh, Chinese encyclopedia. Uh, um, I, I have to read it uh, because it's fascinating and it makes me laugh every time. And actually Foucault also uh, said that he always laughs at this classification, uh, uh, but with a sort of uneasiness. <laughs> uh, uh, so, so this is the certain Chinese encyclopedia uh, where animals are divided into the following categories. Uh, so the first category uh, is uh, animals belonging to the emperor. Uh, the second category are animals who are tame. Uh, the third category are sucking pigs. Uh, the fifth are just fabulous animals. Uh, the sixth uh, uh, is stray dogs. The seventh are the animals included into this classification. Uh, eight are animals uh, which have just broken a water pitcher and so on. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a long, uh, it's an encyclopedia, which is uh, uh, obviously big, uh, but what is interesting here and what brings Foucault to laughing, but also to a certain, I call uneasiness, uh, uh, is uh, that this cl classification obviously brings together things which otherwise couldn't be classified in that way. So in, in, in a way, it brings together things which are inappropriate. Uh, and this was the origin of, of virus mythologies, if you allow me to, to be a bit self-referential, uh, in the sense of uh, uh, re-questioning what does copyright mean, uh, going back to the free culture of, of, of uh, the beginning of the internet, uh, where this sort of creativity uh, uh, was nourished and uh, it was really, really flourishing, which doesn't mean that today it isn't, it is. Uh, uh, but uh, the origin was precisely to put together inappropriate things, uh, like you have seen, uh, uh, for instance, uh, not now, nothing inappropriate now, but for instance, in the last episode, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Nikola Tesla, uh, things which uh, uh, I think create a new meaning. And this is precisely what Aaron Schwartz was, a uh, big hero of mine, and of, of Kenneth Goldsmith. Uh, uh, and many others, uh, the custodians, uh, uh, what Aaron Schwartz was actually uh, talking about, you know, that I would even go so far, I mean, I, I said it actually in the last episode, that there is no such thing as a genius, uh, because all creativity uh, actually relies on uh, 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 subversion, on uh, uh, creativity which is building itself on, all, on already built signs. And then through, through a very co complex system, through semiosis, these signs produce a new me meaning. Uh, uh, and this is something what was uh, really characteristic of uh, the avant-garde, uh, which was a characteristic of the Situationist International, uh, which was char a characteristic of uh, many movements uh, which uh, from the perspective of mainstream uh, even today remain marginal. Uh, 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 but uh, virus mythologies uh, 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 actually uh, draws this inspiration from, from these movements and what they have been doing. And uh, one of my inspirations uh, is uh, one of the biggest, most important libraries free open libraries of the avant-garde on the internet called UbuWeb. Uh, um, and not only UbuWeb, but a whole movement, which again, maybe from the perspective of mainstream is on the mar margins, but not from the perspective of the deep state and secret services. They are really looking what they are doing and hello to the NSA and CIA and everyone else if they are watching this. Uh, our next guest uh, uh, is uh, Kenneth Goldsmith. Uh, the founder of Ubu Web in 1996, uh, a, a writer, a poet who published several books, a performer, a teacher, uh, a librarian, an archivist, uh, someone uh, for whom I'm really happy that uh, he's joining uh, today. And if there wasn't this DMTV virus mythologies, 
uh, who knows? Uh, we have common friends, but we never met. And this is the first time actually that we are made meeting in this online space. And it is thanks to the archive, thanks to this moment, which is now already passed, uh, but is a, it's actually also something which will be in the future. So Kenneth, did you come? Yes. Like a Deus Ex Machina. Hi, Kenneth. Uh, hey, Stretchko, how are you? I'm fine. I just warmed up a bit. I, I hope it made some sense. Uh, uh, I don't know whether you watched it, but uh, yeah, let's let's start. I mean, how are you? Where are you? Maybe just to start in this way. Uh, uh, so how are things? I mean, in the United States, uh, the situation is a bit... So let me pose the question like this. Uh, you know, when Derrida talks about the archive, uh, it's not just about the past, but also about the future. And in a way, we, the China at the beginning of the coronavirus was in the future. We in Europe were somehow in the middle. And, uh, 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 you know, United States was somehow in the past, in the sense that what happened in China started to happen then also in Europe and then in the United States. And even at this moment, when the situation is getting a bit uh, more relaxed, to put it like that, uh, in Europe, I know it's pretty hard in the United States, right? Maybe you can just say a few words about that. And... Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's terribly hard. Um, and it's terribly hard where I live. Uh, I live on a small island off the coast of America called Manhattan, uh, to quote Spalding Gray. Um, and it's strange because I'm told I'm in the middle of an uh, epicenter of an epidemic. Uh, and yet I can't feel it because I really can't leave my house. And so I kind of, it's, it's a sort of strange doubling and the strange distancing where I know this is going on all around me. It's affected people I know. I can't see those people. I can't help. They don't want, you know, they're not asking for volunteers. I'd love to volunteer, but you know, they say, just stay home. Uh, the streets of New York are desolate. Uh, they're empty, they're bereft of energy. Uh, 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 at night, it's now dangerous. I mean, I now, now, you know, we we feel like the global South here in New York. Uh, the privileges that we've enjoyed, uh, such as being able to take a walk after dark, are no longer available to us. Uh, half the police force appears to be out with coronavirus, um, and uh, yeah, it feels very, very dangerous around here. Um, so, in a sense, I'm getting the same information that you're getting in Vienna. Um, and it feels almost as far from me because I'm looking out uh, at a brick wall on an alley on some uh, empty offices. And uh, these are usually bustling with people uh, and they've been empty now for a month and they'll probably be, em be empty for a few more months. Uh, so it's a strange, you know, I mean, it's isolation, truly quarantine. Um, so I, I can't tell you much more about New York than what you know, because I think I know about the same. <laughs> yeah, but you mentioned the word, and I, I would love to, 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 to yeah, start from that. You mentioned privilege, uh, because obviously the two of us are privileged uh, because we are in isolation and we have a home and so on. Uh, so if someone is watching us uh, in the past or in the future or at the moment live stream, uh, who is a worker from, I don't know, Arizona or Texas, uh, wouldn't that person also think that the two of us talking about the avant-garde, art, archiving, are privileged? Uh, uh, you know, it, it's a sort of rhetorical question, but not necessarily. Uh, and I don't think that we are privileged in that way, because, for instance, at this DMTV, uh, just a few days ago, we had the Amazon organizer, uh, Chris Smalls, you know, who is an organizer who, who organizes people to go on an Amazon strike. Uh, but I put the question in this kind of provocative way uh, in order to ask you why? Why is it important uh, precisely in a moment of a global pandemic uh, to go back 
to the avant-garde, uh, 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 go back. I mean, later we can speak about the very term uh, uh, of the avant-garde. Uh, uh, we will also come to your book, Marcel Deschan uh, is my lawyer, which is going to be published at Columbia University Press very soon. Uh, but before we come there, maybe just this self-explanatory question. I mean, for me, it's obvious, but I would love to hear your thoughts. Uh, why precisely at this moment of a deep crisis, when people are struggling to survive, many people are going unemployed, uh, it seems to be privileged to talk about the avant-garde, about art, about archiving, and so on. Uh, uh, but why is it not? You know, why is it important? For, from your perspective of someone who has for decades uh, been uh, curating, archiving, uh, thinking, writing about avant-garde? Well, I think it's a great question. Um, education is a privilege. Um, and most people are educated for practical uh, uh, necessities. Um, and so it calls into question the entire purpose of a liberal arts education. Uh, you know, so, I mean, why would people study English uh, when, when, you know, you could be studying business or, or, or science? Um, and, you know, I mean, the traditional answer to that is that, uh, is that uh, the liberal arts uh, uh, make you uh, a deeper and a better person. We don't expect most people, my students, for example, uh, to go out and, and, and uh, uh, remain poets their whole lives. But uh, it reminds me uh, of, of my grandfather, uh, who was an alcoholic and a very fouled lawyer. Uh, and he really hated law. It was his day job but what he lived for was his books. And he actually thought of himself as an intellectual. He had to support himself, obviously. But at the end of the day, he would come home and he would spend his evenings in his library, which he really felt to be his real soul and his real life. And of course, the next morning, he would get up and, 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 and you know, do sort of what, what, what he would consider to be dirty work. Uh, you know, it's the life of the soul, isn't it? And without, without that, uh, you know, what, what, what really is the point? Mm. Yeah, in, in your book, uh, Marcel Duchan is my lawyer, a book which I, I, I really liked. Uh, uh, I have read it uh, in one breath during the last days. Uh, uh, and it's a memoir of not just Ubu Web, I would say. It's a memoir of a whole scene which, which is surrounding uh, Ubu Web uh, as a shadow, but also as co-conspirators of a free culture, uh, which still exists, uh, uh, but with the surveillance state, uh, it is kind of on the margins. Uh, uh, in your book, you speak about people such as your grandfather, uh, you know, uh, people who are autodidacts, did, did they pronounce it well this time, autodidacts, yeah? Uh, uh, who are self-taught artists, uh, who are, uh, you know, people who are, who were like your grandfather actually, like myself when I was young as well, you know, you, 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 you go to the library and you have your own classification of searching things. Uh, so I think your memoirs really show that very well in which way uh, this kind of creative process, which is not necessarily imposed by uh, the, the discourse of the university, uh, can be more creative uh, uh, than uh, uh, the university discourse, if you, if you want to put it like that. Uh, so uh, I would come back, okay, maybe we... Uh, uh, Let's go back to the start, maybe for those people who have never been to Ubuweb, which I think should be punished by law, although we are against the law, uh, as, as, as an instance we should publish any, uh, pu punish anyone, but I think if you haven't been to Ubuweb, go now and download as soon as possible, because that's what Kenneth Goldsmith says uh, uh, in his new book. Uh, so Kenneth, can you, can, can you tell us, uh, especially for those who don't have a clue, and uh, uh, perhaps, uh, uh, how did it all start? I mean, UboWeb today is really one of the most influential archives for avant-garde art, uh, music, video, but also, you know, you have Urlike Meinhof's uh, radio plays, uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat's hip hop, Brecht, Beckett, and many, many, many other artists who are maybe not so known. Uh, you founded it in 1996. Uh, was your grandfather an influence on this? And how did, you, how did you get to this idea? How did it grow to the moment where it is today? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, I just also wanna say that the avant-garde gives us a sense of the future. 
um, and, and kind of various futurisms with all their problems. And boy, were there a lot of problems politically. Yeah. Uh, it, it, colonialist, uh, 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 anti I mean, in every way. Okay. Uh, but I think that I feel the avant-garde and in particular certain strains of modernism show us how we were going to live in the 21st century. I think they offer us clues as to, uh, as to uh, how to understand the digital through the uh, refracted surfaces and shattered surfaces of modernism. I think one of the problems uh, everybody has with the internet is that everybody's trying to make what is uh, essentially a shattered and fractured medium into something singular. It's either good or it's bad. We're being surveilled, we're not being surveilled. It's free, it's paid. Um, and I think what modernism asked us to do was to embrace these contradictions and to embrace um, the fact that there's never going to be a resolution, nor will there be singularity. In fact, that our state of being uh, is a shattered state. So you think of the uh, many windows that are open on my screen currently, on my computer screen right now. It has the same multi-perspectival uh, 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 context as cubism. Cubism showed many shattered surfaces, many things going on in one window at one time and said, you know, it's possible uh, to see more than one point of view, okay? Sometimes we can, um, uh, we, we get upset because people are walking through the streets like zombies wow. on their cell phones. But of course, uh, uh, the surrealists has seen that as a, a walking dream state. You're both here and you're not here. Uh, I, I think that Breton would be delighted to see masses of people that are dreaming on the street, being elsewhere, speaking to themselves, these sort of mad soliloquies that we're all doing uh, constantly. So I think that, you know, even the network seems to be anticipated by the canvases of abstract expressionism. I mean, what is a Jackson Pollock but a wire, you know, an image of a wireless a nodal network uh, where we have equal distribution, where there is no center, where there is no focus, uh, where everything is just a sim simply a point contingent upon other points. Now, you know, this is a very idealized uh, uh, version of modernism and we can get to the problems of it, though I know, I think most people really know what they are. Um, but I actually want to misread modernism as a way of understanding our digital age. And so with that, um, I ended up building an archive of the avant-garde, which made beautiful sense on the web. You see, the artifacts of the avant-garde have very little economic value, but great historical value. Okay, so you can actually, as I have done, create a vast archive of non-permissioned uh, important artifacts because nobody's going to come after you for something that uh, nobody's going to go to in a theater to start with, okay? Uh, and so the avant-garde, unlike something that, that, that actually has a kind of material value to it, nobody's going to come after you uh, for these kinds of things. So, so it made perfect sense for me to uh, build this archive. Now it's 25 years. It says next year is the 25th year of this. The site is run for 25 years with no money. Okay, It's possible to uh, <clears throat> do things today on the web with no money. Don't, don't listen to what they tell you. You do not need a million dollars to start a website. It didn't used to be that way and it still isn't that way, but they'd like you to think that it still is that way so that you end up paying them. You can still do what you did 25 years ago like I did. You can write HTML, you can own your own servers, you can control your servers, you can give your, your money to ISPs that, that are, are, are benevolent and, and politically uh, attuned. Uh, people that are your friends, uh, 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 people that are your allies. Not everything has to be outsourced. You know, Facebook uh, and, and, and Google want you to think that they are the internet. And in fact, they are not the entire internet. The other internet that's always existed still exists. And this is a, a, a something that, that we've forgotten, uh, it, it, you know. So you can still go build a website. You don't need a million bucks. Uh, we, We've done it on no money, and we won't touch money. I refuse. To yeah, I think you made you you made an important point uh, about the very concept of the archive. Uh, you know, because usually archive, I mean, the Derrida already makes this connection connection between the archive and the institutionalizing, 
uh, you know, those who have the power are those who classify, those who impose meaning, you know, what is the artist who is worth to be in an archive? Unless, uh, uh, unlike Ubu Web, for instance, where of course uh, it's all alphabetic, you know, it's uh, uh, basically you don't, you don't curate who, which artist is on the first place or the second place. Uh, uh, so, I mean, you connected to power already in the way that uh, since the foundation of Ubu Web, uh, it was connected to the open source culture, culture uh, to the free culture of the internet. Uh, you also printed out uh, 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 many things uh, from Aaron Schwartz uh, uh, to Hillary Clinton. Uh, uh, maybe we can talk about that as well. Uh, but before we come there, uh, let us make a transition maybe by playing the first uh, uh, artifact uh, from UbuWeb, uh, uh, because I, I think, let's make this transition, if I, if, let me be, yeah, sorry. Can I just say something also, yeah. but people probably don't, most people don't know what UbuWeb is, simply because we've removed ourselves from Google. And you actually, if you own a domain, you can actually remove yourself in, 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 in America. I think it's what easier. Does that mean? If you, you search on Google, it wouldn't appear? Or no, it doesn't. You know, people write books about how to get your Google ranking higher. We want ours lower. We want to disappear so it becomes something that, you know, something among friends. Like, you know, know. It, was also, it was created before Google, right? Yeah, it's created two years before Google. Um, and so, so uh, uh, you know, the it's, it's ubu.com, uh, it's simple, three letter word, uh, ubu.com. Um, and you know, if, if, if you haven't been, you, you can check it out, uh, but it's hard to find. <laughs> yeah, so let's, sh shall we show the first clip? I think, uh, because you know, what you just mentioned before is, and you also mentioned it in Marcel Duchan is my lawyer, the book which is coming out. Uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, the DNA of the web is embedded uh, in the art movements, uh, surrealism, cubism, as you just said, of the 20th century. Uh, and if there is one, uh, one proof of that, I think is, uh, it's the clip which uh, we will show, can dialectics uh, uh, break bricks? Maybe you can just announce it for, for those who, who don't know something about it. And uh, for myself, as who was influenced by the situationists, uh, maybe also you can say a word about why situationists uh, are so present at uh, uh, UBU. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, again, situationism uh, 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 in, many, in many respects uh, predicted the way that we would be on the web. Uh, 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 you know, the, the notion, which we don't do anymore, but when the web first started, we used to surf the web, uh, you know, not know where we're going getting lost on the internet. Sometimes there used to be something called web, web rings. And it was the sites that were linked and you would click on the thing to go to the next web link. So that if I was doing something about uh, futurism, then my in my next web link, it would go over to a, a site of other futurism. And you never really knew where you were going to. Now, of course, you know many people consider just kind of surfing randomly on the web to be a dangerous activity. And I guess in some places it can land you into some trouble, but again, you know, it's still possible and it's still fun to randomly search the web. As a matter of fact, um, the algorithm of randomness was was so hardwired into the DNA of the into the DNA of the web that up until a few years ago, Google on their front page had the "I'm feeling lucky" button. Okay, wow, you know, it's, it's like you know, take you to something that you don't know. And this is the problem with the algorithm, the algorithmic culture. Uh, uh, reinforces more of what you know. It gives you more of what you know. Uh, it reifies your taste instead of exposing you to something new. Now, of course, that's in the service of marketing. Uh, but but uh, uh, so so the situation is one thing they used to love to do uh, was what they called a, a, a derive, and uh, it was a way of of, of defamiliarizing uh, the city. You know, look look at your city, and if you were to map where you go every day, you kind of take the same trails, you know, you go from the, from the house to work, to the gym, to the restaurant, to home. And the next day you go to, from the home, to the gym, to the restaurant, to work, et cetera, et cetera. And you don't really go off trails, you know, this in, in many places, of course, going off, off road can be very dangerous. Um, and what the situationists wanted to do was to defamiliarize the city. So what they would, they would get blindingly drunk on a, on a Friday night and then 
stumble around Paris, not knowing where they're going, you know, just to, just to just for you know the sake of defamiliarizing that normal routine to imbue uh, the mystery and the magic of the urban experience. Again, this is before Google Maps, and this is before uh, uh, you, you know not get you know now we can't get lost, okay? And so 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 the beauty of the of the library, and I think we've all had this experience. I mean, all of us have had this marvelous experience at one point in our lives of going into a library not with an idea, a physical library, and just starting to pull random books off the shelves because their spines or their title drew us and attracted us, okay? And uh, it was a whole alternative way of learning. I mean, no, no syllabus was ever constructed around randomness, uh, pulling random books off shelves, you know, it's all programmatic. So I think the situationists were interested in taking uh, common experiences and artifacts and defamiliarizing them so as to imbue them with a sense of wonder and a sense of magic and also political possibility. Uh, imagine if we could always be unconstrained in our lives, without borders, without fears, without fears of otherness, without fears of quote, bad neighborhoods, without fears of other people, you know, absolutely a, a wide open circumstance. So it's utopia. Um, and so what we're going to see is a, a little clip from a film from 1974 uh, by Rene Vianney. And this guy, was so great. He just took old films, like shitty old genre films, like kung fu flicks and porn films. And uh, what he did was he would re-subtitle them with uh, with 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 Marxist uh, Mar Marxist uh, 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 jargon and rhetoric, so that the fight in a kung fu film became a fight for class struggle. And of course, he couldn't understand the language, you know, the, the, the Chinese or or the girls of Kamare, which is which is a, a Japanese porn film. He didn't understand it, so he just just had them speaking up for workers' rights, for women's rights, against oppression, against colonialism. Uh, and, and, and they're very, very funny. They're not, it's not only funny, but it became a way in which uh, we would begin to um, detourn uh, cultural artifacts on the internet, like, like re-subtitling a video. Uh, uh, I think as we'll see, uh, the Hitler bunker meme. You know, anytime when a, a video is re-subtitled, you have to understand that people were doing this many, many decades before particularly the situation is. So I think it would be really fun to watch this. Uh, just a short, a short excerpt. <laughs> Ni pour les pillages des grandes surfaces. Le travail, voilà votre seul rôle. Travail, famille, patrie, travail, famille, patrie, ne sortez pas de là. Je ne veux plus entendre parler de lutte de classe. Sinon, je vous envoie à mes sociologues. Et s'il le faut, mes psychiatres, mes urbanistes, mes architectes, mes Foucault, mes Lacan. Et si cela ne vous suffit pas, je vous envoie même un structuraliste. Bureaucrate <rire> 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 L'idéologie ne peut que voler, on est que là, au contact de la subjectivité radicale. <laughs> yeah, I saw you were also laughing at watching it, and you probably watched it like for hundred hundred times. Uh, I watched it also. I must thank uh, uh, David for cutting it. I think uh, uh, he cut uh, a really nice part of it, and it shows actually what you say. You know this defamiliarization. You know what uh, Darko Subin from ex Yugoslavia, great Brechtian scholar, uh, called uh, in in terms of science fiction. He called it cognitive 
estrangement, you know, going back to the referendum uh, effect of, of Brecht, because you put two things together and they produce a new meaning. Uh, and that was, I, I really love it uh, because that was also my influence for the virus mythologies. Also, I've been playing, uh, uh, you know, putting subtitles. And when I was reading your book, uh, which is coming out, uh, thanks for sending it over uh, in two months, you know, also in this situation. So this, this thing here was created, you know, during a global pandemic. As you said, we are happy enough that it's happening outside and uh, we didn't see dead bodies uh, except on television and, and videos and so on. Uh, but in this situation, uh, uh, for me, it became a kind of way out. Not a way out as a sort of escape, you know, to, to, to edit these videos, to add subtitles. Uh, it's, it's fun. But at the same time, it's also uh, this kind of referendums effect where you can change meaning. And when I was reading your book, uh, uh, Marcel Duchamp, uh, uh, as my lawyer, you mentioned how there you have a practice, right? Uh, that every day uh, in the evening from 10 o'clock or something, you go to the archive, you add to the archive and you do it for, what, more than 25 years. And uh, at one point you mentioned Samuel Beckett. Uh, who famous, famously said, you must go on, I can't go on, I'll go on. And that, that many times you wanted to just leave, leave the project, leave the archive to others. Uh, but then there were some shadow librarians, custodians, uh, uh, who convinced you otherwise. Uh, maybe, but okay, we will also have some, yeah, I would love to talk about the shadow library because at the beginning we started with Fahrenheit as well. But maybe before we start, uh, because I will forget, uh, maybe we show the Bruno Gans, uh, 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 ex, uh, you know, the, the, the short clip. And before we, we show it, because you wanted to show it, uh, I mean, it's obvious what is the connection with the previous clip, but maybe you can just uh, uh, say, you know, in which way these two things and methods are connected. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I find that my, my students um, don't give a shit about anything I'm talking about unless I can connect it to the internet somehow. Okay, and then suddenly they become very interested, you know? So, um, uh, you know, it's too abstract, it's too far away, it's in black and white, it's in another language, it's, it's dealing with, with critical theory and, 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 and political theory. Uh, and then I show them a clip of like what, the way that they live, and I say, well, actually, it's the same exact thing. And then suddenly it opens up a way for them to, uh, to, to become involved. And again, um, you know, it's always a portal. It's always like, you know, it, 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 people, people think, you know, that the, 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 uh, I think as you were saying earlier, or actually as Aaron Swartz was saying in that clip, uh, you, you know, everybody thinks this is the first time around for everything, you know, and, and, and culture is built upon previous culture. And the problem is it's mostly not noticed. And so you can see the Bruno Ganz Hitler bunker thing, which we'll show in a second. And most people think that's very funny. It's very cute. We can always, you know, and it's got a great use value as a meme. Um, but the sort of historical connection um, that it can make back to VNA or back to back to the, the notions of, of subtitling and language and false subtitles. Sometimes uh, you down, pirate a video and you download a subtitle and it's slightly off. The translations are bad. Sometimes the special characters are not rendered properly. You know, all of these sort of beautiful errors actually make for new experiences. Um, and so the notion of the perfect artifact uh, uh, is, is, is a fallacy. Um, the perfect artifact is, 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 is something like Hollywood, which attains for some sort of unrealistic perfection, uh, whereas somebody like Hitto Sterl uh, talks about, uh, or Boris Groys, uh, talk about the beauty of the weak artifact. The weak artifact is in its availability to be remixed, reconfigured, and, and to be had. I'd rather give a bad quality something that everyone can have than a good quality something that no one can have. And this of course gets to the problem of the art market uh, where, where the art market is based upon uh, singular artifacts in a time in which an artifact's value is determined not by its singularity, its scarcity, but by how many people can actually have it. A democratic idea of distribution. Okay, and so you have the art world which is increasingly beginning to uh, resemble the antiques market. You know, uh, you know. Here's my 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 singular chest, and uh, you know, it's it's becoming so marginalized that I think 
soon few people will care. It doesn't really, it, it won't really matter. So the shitty artifact, when you see um, people complain sometimes about the resolution, though people have stopped complaining about resolutions of video because that's become the new normal. Okay, uh, you know, we, we, accept a, we, we accept a 15th generation uh, a rip now as a normal. People, sometimes filmmakers complain about the, the, the quality of their work on Ubu. But in fact, if it wasn't on Ubu, it wouldn't be seen at all because there's only a chance that your film is going to be playing at a place like the Anthology Archives uh, in New York, uh, once probably every seven or eight years. And for you to get there and see that thing, you've got to have a hell of a lot of privilege. You've got to have money to fly yourself to New York. You've got to go to a hotel. You've got to pay the admission fee. You've got to feed yourself. You've got to do all this stuff. So the fact, I think that Groys and Sterl are right. The weak image is now the new strong image, the democratic. And of course, this has been going on forever with bootleg CDs and DVDs and in, in, in markets around the world, okay. But I think that we have to begin to, to, to uh, embrace, um, embrace the, the, the democracy of distribution as opposed to the fetishization of quality. I think we need to relinquish control. We also need to relinquish control of copyright. Give it to somebody to remix. Because people sometimes complain that uh, they've been bootlegged on Uberweb. And I say, if somebody bootlegs you, You've actually made it as an artist. Somebody cares enough in the world about your work to bootleg you. That's incredible. Most artists, 99.9% .9 of artists never get that recognition. They can't give their work away. Nobody wants to bootleg them, okay? So next time that somebody pirates your work, you should thank them because they care, okay? And in the work that we're doing, it really isn't gonna take much money out of your pocket. We all have to have day jobs. Uh, you know, most of us in this field, I mean, with a very few, you know, the 1.1.1% the, the of Jeff Koons type artists that make their living as an, uh, make, make, make their living. I think artists want love. Artists want recognition. Artists want history. I think Jeff Koons wants all of that, but he really wants money. Okay. All right, you know, go ahead. Uh, so the idea of sharing is really love. And again, if, if you're fortunate enough to be, be pirated, then you're, then you're actually loved as an artist. And that no, no amount of money can buy love, that kind of love for an artist. Yeah, maybe, maybe uh, I, I really love what you said, but at the same time, uh, uh, Advocatus Diaboli sitting here on my shoulder, when, 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 when the Advocatus Diaboli hears uh, sharing is love, and love is sharing. I immediately, I immediately go back to the circle. You know this science fiction dystopian book where it is precisely the Silicon Valley ideology and hegemony which imposed sharing, not in the sense as you understand it or as Aaron Schwartz understood it, as something which is you know a new commodification, a new. No, 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 no. I mean, but let's come back to that later. Don't let them don't let them steal sharing from us. No, you've already, you've already let them steal it from us. No. <laughs> no, 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 I just wanted to say, let's go back to that after Bruno Gantz uh, and then start to talk about open source, copyright, shadow libraries and other topics. So I suggest that we show first Bruno and then we come back very soon. Okay. I'm ein Führer. Sie suchen also an, Berlin zu verlassen. Mein Führer, wie Sie wissen, sind alle ärztlichen Administrationen und Verbände, die der SS und Himmler unterstellt sind, inzwischen aus Berlin abgezogen. Himmler ist ein Verräter. Er wird seiner gerechten Strafe nicht entgehen. Mein Führer, als Reichsarzt SS gibt es für mich keine Aufgaben mehr hier. Ihr Anspruch, in Berlin zu verlassen, ist ganz und gar unakzeptabel. Meine Familie, falls die Russen mich, ich muss hier weg. Sie haben nichts Unrechtes getan. Was Sie mit Ihren medizinischen Forschungen erreicht haben, dafür werden Ihnen kommende Generationen dankbar sein. Ich übernehme für alles die volle Verantwortung. Wir sprechen ein andermal darüber.
Wir können den Gruppenführer Fegelein nirgendwo finden. Er ist nicht in der Bunkeranlage. Was soll das heißen? Sie können Fegelein nicht finden. Dann suchen Sie ihn eben. Ich will Fegelein sehen. Sofort. Wenn er sich ohne Befehl entfernt hat, ist das Fahnenflucht. Verrat. Bringen Sie mir Fegelein. 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 I can see, I can see you liked it. I mean, this is the amazing thing with this kind of uh, meme post situationist or, or situationist kind of uh, 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 artifacts that as many times as you see them, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you and me have seen this kind of Bruno Gans, Hitler uh, memes, like hundreds of them, you know, when the, there are US elections, you can see it, when there, when there is anything, you can see it. And each time it succeeds, just by adding the subtitles to create a new message and so on. And this is it. I mean, as you said, this is the connection between the situationists and the contemporary pop art or however you call it, you know, this democratized uh, sort of uh, culture artifacts. Uh, and it brings us back uh, to the topic of copyright. Uh, in your book, you mentioned, in Marcel Duchamp is my lawyer, you mentioned uh, this quote by Guy Debord, one of the founders of the uh, Situationist International, uh, where he says that uh, everyone should be encouraged uh, uh, to use things uh, without thinking about uh, property rights, without uh, even, um, I mean, that's from, from today's uh, perspective, especially in this kind of commodified art world and so on, that sounds like a blasphemy, you know, when he says that you can steal it, take it without even acknowledging the other. Uh, uh, and that's what we could have seen in this clip, which we showed now, you know. Uh, so, uh, yeah, just a comment, but I, I promise that I would love to talk to you about the shadow libraries, uh, because it is connected to this. Uh, you write about it uh, a lot uh, in your memoir. Uh, we have some common friends, it appears, uh, from uh, all over ex-Yugoslavia, who are the pioneers, uh, among the pioneers uh, in this scene. Uh, and uh, besides uh, Yubu, there is also, uh, I mean, of course, you don't uh, conceptualize it, at least according to your book, uh, your archive as really a shadow library uh, in the sense of other shadow libraries, but it is part of this, I would say, shadow movement, to put it like that, which is trying to preserve a memory of the world. Uh, so the first shadow library is memory of the world. Uh, then there is uh, monoscope, arc, and there are the custodians online and many others. Uh, the one closest to my heart is, of course, uh, uh, the memory of the world, uh, because uh, uh, they made, I come from ex-Yugoslavia, and in the 90s we had this big problem that uh, most of the books which were connected, not just to communism, but even to Russia, you know, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, uh, they were thrown out of public libraries because uh, they were connected to communism uh, 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 through semiosis, you know, the ruling ideology uh, put all the books into a same category, classi classifying them as communists, throwing them away, and then you had these shadow li librarians uh, whom you mention a lot uh, in your memoirs and uh, who are your friends and your co-conspirators, uh, who saved the books by digitalizing them. Uh, so, and this brings us directly to open source, uh, to a fight against copyright. Uh, so since you've been involved in this struggle from the, from, from the very start, uh, you, I, I think you knew Aaron Schwartz, uh, uh, you know, you were part of this movement from, from the beginnings. Uh, could you perhaps say, you know, when you look back 25 years, and today, I mean, you still say there is still a free internet and so on, but obviously the control is growing. Uh, how did this, first, can you explain the very concept behind the shadow library? And then how, do, how does the shadow library still resist if we are living in this universe, universe of the market, of products, commodification, and so on? Maybe just some examples or experiences of, of these shadow libraries. And what is the connection between your archive and the memory of the world, monoscope, and others. I, I, I know it's a big question, but it's okay. sorry. <laughs> it's not, it's, it's, not it, it's not known. It's not theorized. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it, it exists, but it, it's not theorized. And again, I think this is one of the problems that we have with digital culture, is we use it very well, but it's very under-theorized. Um, and that, you know, therefore we're quite ignorant. Uh, and I, I enjoyed very much watching 
the Shoshana Zuboff talk that you guys did uh, last week or the week before. Um, and she's theorizing something about our digital culture that we take for granted. And we've begun to push back against those types of surveillance systems now. So the more we theorize something, uh, the more aware we become of it. And uh, you know, it, it's, not, it's not like breathing. It, it's, it's much more complicated. So um, the shadow libraries is a term that emerged a couple of years ago to describe um, libraries that build themselves independently in the shadow of regular libraries. So uh, my students or myself, when uh, they leave university, they usually lose access to their university library. The day you graduate, they revoke that card. Uh, and since public libraries, particularly here in the US, are being shelled, where do you go when you need a book? They, now you can go buy them on Amazon or, or whatever, uh, which will cost you a fortune, particularly if you're looking for a quote or something. You can try to go to Google Books, but after three pages, you, you've reached the end of your Google Book thing. Uh, your, free, your free thing lasts for three pages. Um, so where do you turn to, okay? Um, you know, you try to try to go to some of the more mainstream file sharing sites and you're not gonna find uh, Derrida or Foucault or anything that you, you know, that, that kind of information. So in response to this gap of knowledge, a number of people over the past five to 10 years have decided to build free open source libraries uh, often user contributed of these types of artifacts that really matter. Um, and that without that would be sealed behind closed gates like, uh, 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 like JSTOR, you know, these kind of like uh, aggregators of academic material uh, that charge a great uh, price, uh, $14 an article, which, which is what Aaron uh, Swartz said, uh, for knowledge that is not only out of copyright and out of print, but by all rights, common knowledge, scientific papers that should be free. These uh, uh, aggregators like, like Elsevier, and, Elsevier and, and JSTOR are hoarding knowledge for profit that should be available to everyone. And this is, of course, uh, something that Swartz fought valiantly for. Uh, and we continue his struggle. Um, and so independently, uh, using no money, of course, none of us are funded, uh, uh, we've decided that it's, it's in the public interest to build shadow libraries of materials available to anybody. Ubu Web is a shadow library, but there's never a password. It's never password protected. Um, uh, you, there's never a donation box. I will never ask for money. You should not have to pay for this kind of knowledge, particularly if I'm not getting money. I shouldn't take money from you. This should all happen without money, and it's fine. That's actually one of the things that makes the site work. Everybody knows, I'm very clear, that, that, that there's no money involved in this. I don't take ads, I will not take grants. If somebody tomorrow wanted to buy the site for a million dollars, I would have to say no. Uh, not, you know, uh, uh, to build an archive like UberWeb today, uh, uh, would, just to clear the copyrights alone would cost millions and millions and mil untold millions of euros, and not to mention you know, the hassles. And we just, put up, we just put up what we want and we don't deal with money. And people in a funny way seem to understand that. We've never been sued. We've never even come close to being sued. In a way, if you're clear about what you're doing and honest and open, uh, people are, are, are going to say, oh, I understand what you're doing. Yeah, I think there is, uh, maybe you can mention it. Uh, I really love this, uh, the, in your memoirs, this story about an artist, obviously everyone knows about, uh, Yoko Ono, and what happened when they contacted you. I don't know whether you can spoil it or we should just... No, I don't, I, I, yeah, it's But fine. I think it's interesting because it shows your philosophy and in which way actually sure. this philosophy is sustainable, you know, that people actually, in the end, give you material or give you the rights. So perhaps you can just mention the story, how it goes, yeah. Sure. Well, I mean, I've got a couple of great stories. I mean, the, my, my favorite one is that somebody from a very powerful publishing uh, a literary agency uh, made a cease and a, a desist claim on us for William S. Burroughs, you know? Now, William S. Burroughs says, you know, language is a virus, it spreads virally, uh, words wanna be free. Brian Geisen said, I've come to free the words. And suddenly you've got this uh, literary agency uh, that, that, that wants to, remove everything with William S. Burroughs. So what they did was they put a, a, a cut and paste of William S. Burroughs into our search engine and then 
put a cease and desist for every single mention of Burroughs, whether it was an actual work of Burroughs or whether it was a citation in an academic paper. Uh, liner notes from some artist saying, you know, on, 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 on Ubu saying they, 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 this is using the William Burroughs technique of cut ups. Okay. Um, and the thing about a cease and desist letter is that they, they say, uh, 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 they, they say, I'm being totally honest here. Uh, and if I'm not, I'm going to, I'm perjuring myself. But of course, they're not honest and they've already perjured themselves by making claims on things that they have no right to. So again, I pushed back and I said, look, I see what you're trying to do, but UberWeb will never share naked lunch. I know where you make your money and that's cool. I'm not gonna fuck with that because it's out there and quite frankly, a copy of Naked Lunch isn't that much money if you wanna buy it. Okay, that's not what I do. I like to deal with out of print and obscure things, things that, that shed lights on the more marginal parts of artistic practice. I said, look, please, please, you know, redo this thing. And if there really is something uh, offensive on there that's, that's really costing you a lot of money, you know, give me, let me see what it is. So they went back in, they just repeated the same thing with a search and with, with, a, with a cease and desist for something, uh, everything in William Burroughs. I said, look, I said, forget it. Uh, I said, please send this, this to the literary estate and please tell them that, that in the spirit of William S. Burroughs, uh, let words want to be free. Um, and, you know, a little bit of discourse goes a long way. If you respond to people when they tell you to take something down and you tell them that you love it and you tell them you're not trying to sell it and you're not trying to rip them off and it's done in good faith from the heart, you know, you're, you're usually going to come back and say, okay, I understand what you're doing, oh, you know, and, and, and this is what happened with Yoko Ono, you know, there, we, we sometimes, we, you know, we put up some films and the Yoko Ono's lawyers came back to us and they said, well, you know, we'd like you to remove everything of Yoko Ono's on the site. And, and we have these um, MP3s of hers from a little magazine from the 60s called Aspen Magazine. And they're really important to the archive. And they're really Yoko doing these weird Japanese folk songs and improvisations. Believe me, it's not walking on thin ice or, you know, a, you know, imagine John Lennon. It's nothing, believe me, you couldn't sell these things if you wanted to. So I said to the lawyers, I said, look, you know, I get what you're saying, but if we rip these things down, it would shred a historical archive. It situates Ono in a historical way that's, that's very flattering and very important. Would you please give us permission to, to host these? And they came back and they talked to Yoko Ono and she said, sure. Now I see what they're doing. They're not trying to pirate. They're not trying to profit. I get it. Okay, you have permission. So we got permission from Yoko Ono. You see, one of the scariest things in the world that we get are, are, are cease and desist letters. They're, they're designed to scare the shit out of you. But most of the time, they, they're really, they're, they're just a warning or, or an invitation to discourse. They are not a legal document. Anybody can take a cease and desist template and send it to you and have it look like a lawyer's letter without any of the bulk of, uh, of, a, of a real threat. And this is what I call folk law. If you know that, then you get these kind of cease and desist letters and it's an invitation to conversation. You write them back. You say, you know, you say, Here's what I'm trying to do. Uh, I think you'd really enjoy what I'm trying to do. As a matter of fact, UberWeb is trying to promote your work at no cost to you. You know, we're doing this because we love you. We think this is important. Um, and they go, oh, really? We thought you were trying to rob us. No, 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 actually. Okay, well, let's, let's see what we can do. And people, are, they want, nobody wants to sue you. Particularly, nobody wants to sue people that loudly profess to have no money. That's not what they do. They're not in it. So you have to really know the materials that, you, that you're dealing with. And you have to have a fucking thick skin to play this game. And I'm talking to everybody out there that's putting up, you know, MP3s up on blogs and they get some kind of automated cease and desist lesson. A, 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 a cease and desist letter and they think their life is over. They think they're getting sued. You're not getting sued. You can mostly ignore those things. If they come back a second time or a third time, you may want to engage in some conversation with them. You are not getting sued. The number of people that have been sued uh, on these types of cases, you can count the cases on, 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 on the fingers of one hand. Okay, and so what they accomplish is ripping their material down, privatizing their material at no expense to them. And you participate in that by saying, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'll take down those MP3s of that psychedelic 
uh, uh, you know, 1960s Swedish psychedelic LP that I ripped. I'm so sorry, beg me for forgiveness. And they've accomplished everything they wanted without spending any money at all. You're giving them a fucking gift. Push yeah, back uh, a little bit and you can, you can actually take control. Mm. I Nobody think that's knows. an important point because uh, uh, if you just, uh, and I do it often, you know, when you go through the, through the archive of Yubu Web, uh, you will see that most of the, not most, I cannot say it like that. I didn't watch so many as you did. No, so man. I don't know. You, you're just crazy and mad, uh, I know. Uh, but uh, if you, you know, many of them would be impossible, as Aaron Schwartz said at the beginning of our conversation, without taking the bricks from someone else, from someone else, putting it together, which would be impossible if we would live in a world of absolute copyright. I mean, a world which is near here and so on, but what you just said with JSTOR, for instance, you know, knowledge is being privatized, but also art. I mean, if you privatize, if you uh, uh, don't give someone the opportunity to see an artwork or to rip it off even, then you prohibit creativity actually. And one of the, uh, of the clips, which I think we need to show, uh, uh, definitely is the one which is called the sound of the end of music, uh, because this clip wouldn't exist if there wasn't another clip, you know, it's a beautiful example where you can see how you need some other sign system which will then be penetrated or hacked into it to create a different sign system or even an artwork. Uh, but, you know, you, you know, the thing, the thing is, it's, it's so common in music, you know, yeah. uh, hip hop has been built on samples for decades. Nobody ever expects uh, somebody, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, a turntablist to get up there and suddenly start playing the saxophone really well to prove that they're talented. The turntablist puts together disparate samples of really interesting things into something new. Somehow this is, you know, but somehow I think in art and I think particularly in literature, these kind of notions of creativity and originality, uh, these myths, these are myths, uh, hold very tightly and they say, you know. Um, uh, so uh, what we're gonna watch now is a clip from a woman named Vicki Bennett who performs under the name of People Like Us. She lives in the UK and Vicky works entirely with pre-existing materials, remixing them, stitching them back together in creative and new and brilliant ways. She's really one of the best people. Now, you know, everybody knows, you know, we have Plunder Phonics and we have hip hop and we have collage in cinema. We have Kenneth Anger detouring, you know, a, an, old, an old religious film. Uh, uh, this is practice continues and, is, and, 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 and continues on in the digital age in a very strong way. Vicki Bennett, everything she releases, she gives to UberWeb to distribute for free, all her music. And she sells those identical artifacts on Bandcamp and she sells a lot of them. Okay, and Vicky sees it as not being, there's not just free culture and there's not paid culture, but there's actually a group of people, first of all, who really wanna support Vicky's work by paying for it. And then there's a group of people for whom free culture really matters to them. And by splitting that and offering things in both sections, she's getting both, she's getting, hitting, hitting every note. Economies are not simple, you know, economies, uh, economies as I don't have to tell you, are, are complex, but cultural economies also, you know, everybody's sort of like it's free culture or none. And I'm kind of thinking that copyright and free culture, there's a lot of gray areas. There's a lot of subtlety and a lot of nuance. Vicki Bennett has given us 40 LPs, four zero LPs up on UberWeb. She has something like, 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 60 films or uh, up on Ubu that she gives away. Vicky makes a great living. I know, not a great living, but she makes, let me ask, pardon me, let me rewind. She makes a living by performing like most bands do today. You know, and, and, you know who sells CDs anymore? I think it's ridiculous. Oh. Bands have, in the, in, the, in the MP3 or streaming economy, bands have now gone on to perform. So the artifact itself is called into question, the kind of, the, the kind of primacy of the cultural artifact. And now it's moving, of course, back into live performance and, and relational work. Of course, now it's not at all, and these musicians are suffering, are suffering terribly as a result. Um, so uh, Vicky, uh, let's just watch this, this very short clip where Vicky remixes the sound of music, uh, the beginning of the sound of music with the beginning of Apocalypse Now. Thank you. 
Since you mentioned uh, the apocalypse, uh, and we have seen an apocalypse now, and uh, Sound of Music, uh, the Hills Are Alive remix, uh, let me ask you a question which is connected to something what you say in, in, uh, in Marcel Duchamp is my lawyer. Uh, you mentioned Michel Foucault, uh, and you mentioned his Archaeology of Knowledge, his book Archaeology of Knowledge, uh, where Foucault uh, compares the archive uh, to geological strata, uh, you know, and, and this is not something new, I would say already, you know, that Freud, of course, who became important for Derrida's conception of the archive, um, was influenced by, by, by archaeology, geology, uh, you know, when, he, when, when Freud went to Pompeii, for instance, and the whole development of the unconscious theory is also a kind of geological strata uh, composition, I would say. Uh, so my question is, if we put this together, geology, which you claim in your book, uh, uh, you know, what is the point about this comparison? In your book, if I'm right, uh, 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 it's that the archive is always open to destruction. The archive is already always open to a catastrophe, uh, whether it is the library of Babylon or, or it is uh, a virus on a computer, it can disappear. Uh, 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 so, if we go a step further, uh, can you imagine a situation uh, in the world uh, where the archive as such and language uh, would completely disappear? You know, that uh, 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 what would happen with the archive if there is no language anymore, if there is no witness who can go into the archive? I mean, it's a very Deridian topic, but did you think, do, did you think about it? Does your compulsion to archive things uh, also come, as with many collectors, from uh, the urge to preserve from the final destruction. And how can you preserve from the final destruction if, I don't know, the collision of climate age and nuclear age come together and in 100 years no there is no archive anymore, except ra radioactive waste. I don't know, how do you see the connection between the apocalypse and the archive? Well, um, I think it can be... be uh, spoken of in much smaller terms. Okay. <laughs> people, assume, uh, uh, people assume that the web is a permanent situation. People assume that because something is on the web, it's going to be there forever. And stick around long enough and you'll find out that that's not true at all. Uh, legal, you know, sort of I, the, the kind, of, kind of floatsome and jetsome of things that appear on Netflix and then vanish. 
okay? Things that appear on YouTube, you, you click on a YouTube link and say, this is not available in your territory due to licensing restrictions. Uh, pirate sites or MP3 blogs go down. I mean, we had the entire MP3 blogosphere back in 2009 ripped down by the U.S. Department of Justice uh, after, uh, you know, following the mega upload uh, debacle. Um, and so what I say is that you need to download. Uh, your local library should be as robust and more robust than anything that you can find online. Hard drives are really, really cheap now. And we should all become our own archivists in a very, very conscious way. Um, in an unconscious way, we're already doing that. Let's think about uh, what, when, when we download MP3s, those of us that still download MP3s, which I do, because my favorite, uh, my streaming services don't offer much of what I love. Um, <clears throat> I have uh, much more music than I'll be able to listen to in the next 10 lifetimes. And yet I keep downloading more just in case. I want my local library to be robust and vast. I don't trust uh, 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 that there's going to be a Wi-Fi connection or even a cell signal uh, available. This notion of streaming media, I've, I've gone to conferences in China uh, and everybody brought their their papers on Google Docs. Well, fuck it. You know, you get to China, shit out of luck. There's no Google there. You know, you can use a VPN. Okay, there are ways around it. But still, um, you know, this assumption of stability is a fallacy. You should download everything. If you love it, download it. Yeah, it just brought me, you probably know this theory, Marcel and uh, our friends from Zagreb uh, uh, know it as well. Uh, Robert Faller, uh, the Aus Aus Austrian psychoanalyst, uh, has this term which he calls interpassivity. You heard about it probably, which reminded me when you just said I download so many, so much music that in the next ten lifetimes I couldn't listen to it, and then Fowler has this theory. You know, this is interpassivity, not interactivity, but interpassivity. Uh, your computer is watching it instead of you. You know, well, but, I, I but what if all of this disappears? What if you know? Okay, obviously we have to download because the internet is not something which will stay forever maybe it will maybe it won't but it can be we can be offline at any moment in a totalitarian state or whatever uh, but what if even that what you downloaded is not an archive anymore i don't know whether this is too apocalyptic or well you know, i i think that we're uh, i think archiving is a folk art now and i think mm -hmm. we're all unconsciously archivists look at my you know look at anybody's download folder you never throw the thing. You, do you ever get to cleaning it out? I mean, you know, no. It's an accrual. And in a way, it becomes autobiographical. You can actually go back and trace the ways of thought, the manners, the paths of, 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 that your mind took and your life took and your emotional life took by reading through, actually, almost as a, a, sed, a, a sedimentation, uh, archaeological literary document of that which you have downloaded, not to mention all of the archiving. For example, when we send an email, we don't just send an email, we make a copy of that email. It gets archived. You send it to somebody and you receive that email, that becomes part of your archive. Um, all of the downloading, all of the approval. So to me, this is, this is really, um, uh, you know, it's, it's happening, but again, not in a conscious way. It's just a big mess that most people don't want to deal with. If we can theorize that as being personal, poetic and autobiographical, then we can actually situate the archive as work of art as well. We're all being artists then. We're all being like Andy Warhol had time capsules. Andy Warhol for the past, you know, for the last 20 years of his life or something, kept a box by the side of his desk and anything that came in to his desk, and Andy Warhol got all sorts of amazing things sent to him, would be thrown into this box. He wouldn't even open it. Sometimes, you know, uh, it would be, sometimes, you know, it would be a uh, uh, first press Rolling Stones uh, uh, LPs signed by Mick, love Andy. He wouldn't even open it. He'd throw it into this box and when, or, 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 or bits of, you know, cash in an envelope be thrown in there mcdonald's wrappers it wouldn't matter there was no discrimination he'd just throw it in and when the fucking thing was filled up he would seal it up and he would sign it as a work of art and he made and over the course of time he made uh, uh, uh hundreds and hundreds of these works of art that accrued and this was archiving as an artistic practice today they're all sitting in the andy warhol museum up on shelves very similar to what i have back here and to open one of these boxes takes months because it takes three people, one person, you know, all with gloves on, 
you know, they've got to take the McDonald's wrapper out and they've actually got to name it and archive it and put it into the database and describe it. And then they've got to go take out, you know, uh, the nude photo of Bianca Jagger and, and, and do that as well. So Warhol knew this was going to happen. He knew he was so important that all of his trash would actually end up being really, really valuable, like everything Warhol did. And it was a trap, but it was also, it was also, it was about posterity and it was about the future and it was about the importance of accrual and archiving. So why can't we look at every act Activity that we do on the web, the way that Warhol looked at his uh, at his uh, 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 archiving uh, activities. Of course, ours. You know, I don't throw out cash, and I don't get signed records from Mick Jagger. Okay, but on a very personal level and a very local level, it actually is a history. It's a, it's, it's historical. Yeah, I find it interesting also that you mentioned the email and that uh, that Derrida in his archive fever mentions the email. Uh, in 1995, uh, which is about the time I started to use an email, probably later, I was too young at that time. But it's amazing that Derrida also speaks about the email and what you just said, if I would look at my email inbox or download folder and so on, it is really like, as you say, and as Foucault says, a sort of geology, you know, you have different levels where you go back and it's also psychoanalysis at the same time because it can tell you something about yourself because everything is archived like old letters or whatever a business deal or a fight with a friend everything is there yeah but since we are a bit running out of time i suggest that uh, you choose the next video and i surprise you with uh, with another video for the end of the show uh, which is not archived yet let's see whether it will be but it's very fresh and very new it was created last week in Vienna, not by me, but I will announce it later. So I, I, I suggest that you choose one of the two others. I mean, it's very difficult. I know for you, at the end of the book, Marcel Deschamps is my lawyer. You have a big list of your, which was also difficult for you, of the Yubu videos. So I suggest we either show the suprematist capital or the conversation. Oh, su uh, the supremacist. Su uh, suprematist, suprematist capital. Yeah. That's great. That's a that's a that's a fun that's a fun thing. Uh, a couple of. Um, artists made this video to make the connection between suprematism, which is Malievich, uh, Russian constructivism, and, uh, and capitalism today. And I think the, the, the connections are, are, are very, very clear between corporate logos and um, modern art. Okay, I think we need to remind our, our, our master of ceremony, David, to show it. Why don't, you you show, why don't you show the, the one that you were going to show? Okay, it's oh. coming. It's coming. Capital. When I just watched these videos, I, I must admit something. I think the, the left today is so pathetic uh, when it comes to, to the visual medium. You know, when you look at this, how much of these kind of uh, artifacts uh, uh, we would need today in order to 
you know, change the minds and, and subvert the signs of the current capitalist hegemony. Uh, uh, and all these movements, which we were just mentioning from suprematists to, you know, to, to the situation is they were subversive. So, well, one thing that, that a lot of modern art, a lot of modern art did was to make itself intentionally weak or ambiguous so that it could not be used uh, by uh, uh, nefarious right wing political parties as, as, uh, as strong symbols. It's another argument against strength. Uh, you know, uh, you know. Look at look at the Nazi swastika versus Amalievich. No, no strong political party ever wanted to use a white on white canvas as their as their logo. And that was, you know, and that was the the resistance of this type of work. Mm. Uh, I mean, it brings it me back to, to yeah, it brings me back to one of the virus mythologies where where I mentioned Roland Barthes and how he considered poetry something which is able to escape the mythology, the ideologization. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, you know, there was a time in the 90s where, where just about every band, including prog rock bands like Faust, I remember one uh, were, 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 were used as soundtracks for commercials. I remember one time seeing a Faust, <laughs> the German prog rock band uh, soundtrack uh, for a bank ad. And I thought, oh, for fuck's sake. But one thing, you know, nobody ever used was, was uh, a, you know, Giannis Zanakis or a John Cage uh, aleatory mm. soundtrack. It's it's non-commodifiable in that way. That is its resistance, is that it is so useless. And W.H. Auden had a great quote. He said, poetry makes nothing happen. And that's its resistance. Poetry, you know, its beauty of poetry is, the, the, is, is that it, it can't be utilized in any way. So that is its resistance. It's a sort of a, a counterintuitive notion of political resistance, but the resistance that I refuse to participate, uh, you know, Bartleby, you know, uh, a, a sort of a Bartle, I, I prefer not to. And uh, there's some very strong, you know, magic in that. Uh, you know, it's one, one use or misuse of poetry. Yeah, I would love to have, uh, you know, just a special episode on poetry. Uh, and uh, uh, listen to your poetry as well. Uh, but let's do it next time. Uh, uh, we have to finish soon. Uh, so before we say goodbye and show the last video, which I will announce, I would love to ask you a question which I asked uh, Franco Berardi before, uh, but a bit modified. You know, I asked before for his message to the future, uh, to, to a future which would come in 2025. Uh, so, I would ask you, who is already now part of an archive, when I'm part of an archive, this is already an archive. Uh, uh, let's imagine this is a time capsule, like Warhols, which it is, although there is not so much bullshit, precious McDonald's and so on inside of it, but who knows what is in your boxes there behind. Uh, so uh, what would be your message to 2025, uh, someone who would watch this, uh, and also, how do you see, and then we will watch it back in 2025, how do you see that the internet will evolve and, uh, uh, until 2025? And how can we prevent that it comes back to what Shoshana Zubov calls surveillance capitalism? Yeah, I think that the future is in the past. Um, what was possible then is possible now. Uh, 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 the utopianism embedded in the nascent web is still possible today. And actually, you know, we've just been brainwashed to think that it is impossible, that it is naive, that it can't happen. It can happen and it continues to happen. I think that spirit of Aaron Swartz and the spirit of shadow libraries and the spirit of keeping things simple, HTML 1.0. UberWeb was built in 1996 on the same templates that I've been writing on last night to upload films. I don't do anything different. Believe me, I'm not much of a programmer. Um, I've never kept up with technology. What I did was basic and basic continues to work. Let's also acknowledge the digital divide and that a lot of folks don't have access uh, uh, to high bandwidth things. UberWeb came up in a time of dial up and I think that was a good idea because it, assure, it ensures that everybody can see and experience everything on that site, regardless, people are working on old technologies. I want backwards compatibility. Um, and also, you know, um, what made the web great in the beginning 
uh, were, were people, were communities and communities of people that cared. Um, and so surrounding yourself and supporting those communities uh, as opposed to outsourcing them to people that don't care and who are in it for profit. So I think the message for 2025 is the message for 2020, which was the message for 2005. I think it's the same thing. I think that's what's important to keep alive here. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Kenneth. And thanks a lot for taking your time. Uh, and thanks a lot for continuing the work which you are doing, uh, although always Samuel, Samuel Beckett's ghost is there, you know, you cannot go on, you must go on. And it's tough, I know it, it's very tough also with the virus mythologies because I just got a message, oh, can you please continue with the series and so on. Uh, but let's see, because it's also exhausting, as you know, although as much as fun as I have. Uh, so for the end, uh, I would suggest everyone to go and download as much as they can. But I would also love to show uh, a clip uh, of a Dear Arts Collective from Vienna, uh, uh, which was made last week, uh, which is reflecting the coronavirus crisis. Uh, so this will be our outro. I'm saying goodbye to everyone and saying bye to Kenneth. And we stay in touch and hopefully we see us soon in the Balkans. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Kenneth. Restrictions, infected restrictions, definitely restrictions, something like a new normal.